Okay, in this minute tutorial, we're going to talk about subdural hemorrhage, which is quite a common form of intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, and you should recall that it's down to rupture of the so-called bridging veins. And let's re quickly remind ourselves about these. So here in black are the two tables of the skull. Um, in red, we're going to draw the periosteal dura. Uh, and also in red we're going to draw the meningeal dura and, as you should recall, wherever the periosteal and meningeal dura separate, we form these dural venous sinuses. So here in blue is one of the dural venous sinuses, could be the superior sagittal sinus, for example. Sitting just deep to the meningeal dura is the arachnoid, okay, and then of course the pia, and the underlying brain there. And the bridging veins are veins that go from the brain through the arachnoid and they bridge across the subdural space on their way to one of the dural venous sinuses. So this, at this point here, this is where the bridging veins bridge. Okay, they bridge the subdural space between the meningeal dura and the arachnoid. And this is the subdural space where our hematoma can collect. And there are two types of um, subdural hemorrhage. On the left, we've got the acute subdural hemorrhage, and on the right, the chronic. And you can tell the difference between these by the appearance of the blood. So in the acute situation, the blood appears as white on a CT scan, whereas in the chronic situation, the blood has been resorbed and changed um, by various metabolic processes, and it becomes black, okay? So the appearance of the blood on the scan tells us whether this is an acute or a chronic bleed. Um, another feature that you should look out for um, when trying to diagnose a subdural is that these are confined to one side and they're typically crescent-shaped. So if you look at both of these, these are both um, affecting the right hemisphere in these CT scans, so they're confined just to the one half of the cranial cavity, and they're crescent-shaped, meaning that the blood is collecting all around the superficial part of the brain, okay, in a crescent-shaped formation, different to the lens-shaped formation that we see in an extradural. Um, now, why is it the case that these hemorrhages just remain in one half of the cranial cavity and don't tend to spread across to the other half all that much. Um, well, that's down to the fact that we've got the falcs, okay? So in the midline, we've got the falcs cerebri that we can see here on our CT scans. And what the falcs does is it constrains the hematoma and prevents it from tracking to the contralateral side, okay? So the blood can't really cross over the falx because it's like a physical barrier in the midline and it keeps the blood in one half of the cranial cavity. So that's the reason why they remain just on one side. Uh, one final point which I'm sure you've already noticed is that in both of these there is midline shift. So here's the falx and you can see that it has been shifted across and the brain has been pushed across to the contralateral side by raised pressure on the side of the hemorrhage. Once again, in the chronic scan, we can see that the ventricle, the lateral ventricles here have been obliterated uh, by compression of the brain, and the whole brain has been shifted across to the left. So subdurals can cause significant um, raised intracranial pressure and midline shift. And that's all I want to talk to you about when it comes to subdurals.